Hello and welcome back to Manifolds, the video series where we want to do calculus on generalized surfaces. And we've already learned, in order to generalize integration, we need to do some multilinear algebra. And therefore, in today's part 28, we will talk about the so-called wedge product. And sometimes it's also called the exterior product for alternating k-forms. But before we go into the definition, I first want to thank all the nice people who support me on Steady, here on YouTube or on Patreon. And please don't forget, no matter how you support this channel, you can always download PDF versions and quizzes for all the videos. Okay, then without further ado, let's start with the topic of today, which is the wedge product. And it is called like that, because the multiplication sign we use here is given by such a wedge. And as already mentioned, we will define this multiplication for the objects we have introduced in the last video. And please recall, we call them alternating k forms on a vector space V. Moreover, k can be any natural number and also zero is possible. Therefore, this multiplication now should be able to combine two different alternating forms, alpha and beta. This means we can see it as a map from the Cartesian product. So we have old k times old s, and then it should map into the alternating k forms again. However, now the outcome should be a k plus s form. So this is what we want to have, and for a reason behind it, you can already think of integration. So for example, if we have a one-dimensional integration and another one-dimensional integration, we want to combine them to a two-dimensional integration. However, the explicit details for that will follow in future videos. At the moment, we can just say that we want such a multiplication in order to deal with these alternating k-forms. Hence, the new form that comes out here is denoted by alpha wedge beta. Now, an important thing we already know here is that this outcome here has to be a multilinear map. More precisely, it has to be a k plus s linear map. This means it gets exactly k plus s vectors from v as an input. And now the question is, how would you define this number here by using alpha and beta? So obviously, we could just use alpha and putting in k vectors, and then we multiply with beta, where we use s vectors. More concretely here, we go from v k plus 1 to v k plus s. So this is definitely a nice definition that gives us a k plus s linear map. So it's a multilinear map, however, the problem is it's not an alternating map with this definition. Therefore, in our case here, we cannot use this simple definition for a multiplication. So we have to do something to make the outcome here alternating again. And now if you remember some linear algebra and the definition of the determinant, you might already know how to do it in this case. In fact, you have to deal with permutations of the vectors we put in. This means that we have to sum up some of the combinations we get from these products here. Okay, then I would say, let's write this down for an alternating k form alpha and for an alternating s form beta. And then as before, we will define the new form alpha wedge beta. Moreover, we already know we have to put in k plus s vectors and then we have to combine alpha and beta with permutations of these vectors. Therefore, I would say let's start with that and let's call the permutation sigma. Therefore, the first input here is v with index sigma of 1. And this continues until we have v sigma of k. So you see, as before, these are the k vectors we put into alpha. And now we have the same with beta, where we also use the permutation sigma. The only difference is now that we can only put in s vectors here. So we go from the index sigma of k plus 1 to the index sigma of k plus s. And now you might already know, we have to go through all possible permutations sigma. And indeed, sigma here is a permutation of a set with k plus s elements. Therefore, we write it comes from the symmetric group with index k plus s. So now with the sum here, we have included 
every possible order of the k plus s vectors inside alpha and beta. And therefore, you could use the alternating fact of alpha and beta to reorder the inputs as you want. And therefore, we immediately see also the sign of the permutation plays a role here. In other words, if we have an odd permutation, we have to cancel that with a minus sign here. Okay, and now we have it. Now you should see that this big sum here gives us an alternating k plus s form. This is guaranteed because we go through all possible permutations anyway. So it's completely similar to the Leibniz formula for determinants. However, in this case here, we want to add a little detail because with these permutations, we do more than we need. In fact, a lot of parts of the sum are repeated simply because, for example, a permutation that only changes something inside alpha here will not change the overall value of the part of the sum. So this is not a problem for the alternating part, but it changes the actual number that comes out here for this form. Hence, in order to normalize this number, we will divide by the number of these repeated parts. So indeed, we have k factorial possibilities inside alpha and s factorial possibilities inside beta. And now we are finally done. This is the whole definition for the wedge product of alternating forms. And with that, I would say we are ready to look at some examples. Let's start with a very simple possibility where alpha and beta are one forms on a vector space V. Indeed, there alternating does not change anything because we only have one vector as an input. For this reason, alt1 is the same as V star, the dual space of V. However, now the wedge product should give us an alternating two form. And in fact, it's not hard at all to explicitly calculate all the terms in the sum here. Simply because there are only two permutations at all. And let's start with the trivial one, the identity that does not change anything at all. Hence, in this case, we have alpha u times beta v. And now you already know, the second one just changes u and v here, but it's an odd permutation, so we have a minus sign. And now we have it, this is the general formula of the wedge product of two one-forms. So easy to remember, but please don't forget, the outcome here is an alternating two-form. And now you might ask, how does this look in a concrete vector space V and maybe we choose R3. So our one-forms now are linear functionals with domain R3. So for example, we could say, alpha of a vector x1, x2, x3 is defined as giving out the first component x1 here. Okay, but now please don't be confused. Now the index here denotes the components of a vector. Before, the index just denotes the number of the vector. So this should not be a problem because it's the usual thing in linear algebra. Okay, now in addition, we can also define beta as a linear functional and maybe it gives the second component. And now what you should know is that we can rewrite that as a matrix product. Namely, we can write a row vector 0, 1, 0 and our column vector x1, x2, x3. And if you see it like that, you could say that beta is actually given by this row vector. So in that sense, giving an alternating one form is the same as giving a row vector here. And now the question is, what does it mean for our two form alpha wedge beta? So now we have to put in two vectors and let's call them x and y with their components. And by the formula above, you already know what to do. So first we have alpha of the first vector, which is x1 times beta of the second vector. So we have x1 times y2, times y1 times x2. And this we now could write as an inner product with a matrix. So let's use the pointed brackets for the inner product and then let's write a 3 times 3 matrix which gives us this result. So it's not hard to see, we have 0, 1, 0 in the first row, then minus 1, 0, 0 in the second row, and also only zeros in the last row. So you see, we can rewrite this alternating two form here with this inner product and a given matrix here. 
Hence, we can identify this matrix with the alternating two form. So you could say, on this concrete level here, our definitions also give very concrete objects. Okay, that is good enough for now, because later we will see much more examples. First, I think it's really important that you know some properties of this wedge product. In general, you should know it's not commutative. Simply because, if you change the order, you get a minus sign depending what is the order of alpha and beta. So you have minus 1 to the power k times s. And then we simply have the other order. So please remember this factor here. Some people just say this is the anti-commutative rule of the wedge product. Now the second thing is a little bit clearer. It's a bilinear mapping. This means if you add two alternating forms alpha and alpha prime here on the left hand side, then you have a distributive rule for the multiplication. So more precisely, you have alpha wedge beta plus alpha prime wedge beta. And please note, if you now use rule A, you get the same property in the second factor. Okay, and I already said we have a bilinear mapping, so we can also scale with scalars here. So roughly said, it means you can pull out the scalar. And as before, this works in the first and the second argument by rule A. And there you should see, this bilinear property is the reason we call this operation the wedge product. So it acts exactly like we would expect it from a multiplication. Therefore, you would also say we need some kind of an associativity law. This means if we have three factors here, does it matter how we set the parentheses? And the answer is no, because associativity holds. Now, I will not write down the proof for these facts, because it's just a manipulation with the permutations. So maybe not so easy, but it just comes out of the definition. For this series here, it's more important that you remember these four rules for the wedge product. So you see, we've already reached the last property now, but for that I first need a definition. Here I need two vector spaces W and V and a linear map between them. And now it turns out that every alternating K form on V can be pulled back to W. This means with the help of F we can define a new alternating K form on W. And the usual name one chooses for that is F star. More concretely, F star alpha is the new alternating form. And in fact, it's often just called the pullback of the alternating form. Okay, so now what is the definition? What happens if we put k vectors from w inside this form? And now the answer is really easy, just use alpha again. And moreover, just put the images of the w vectors into alpha. So you see, now we have k vectors in v here on the right hand side, so this definition works. So please remember that, this is how we define the pullback. So not a complicated definition, but a very important one. And now the natural question is, what happens if we apply this pullback to the wedge product? So can we simplify f star of alpha wedge beta? And indeed we can, we can just calculate the wedge product of the two pullbacks. So please remember that, the pullback can be pushed into the wedge product. And here I can tell you, this property means for some people, that the wedge product is natural. Moreover, I can already tell you, for calculating on manifolds, this will be a very important property. Therefore, I would say, let's use the next video to push all these definitions and properties to manifolds again. So I really hope I see you there, and have a nice day. Bye bye.